So today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Briand, who's our new director of civic engagement at Chico State. And I, I want to mention how important this concept and uh, this idea is, because um, we've been, there's been a group of us meeting for part of this last year, talking about civic engagement and how to incorporate civic engagement into our classes. And th this is especially important now with our redesign of general education classes because it's part of the mission of general education that students be involved in, in civic engagement. So as we redesign general education classes, and of course it's valuable for all classes, but we particularly for general education, we need to be thinking about how do we get involved, get students involved in their community? How do we get students thinking and participating in topical issues? So I'm pleased that Michael is going to be speaking about that today. Can you hear me at the back of the room? This is not the smallest audience I have ever addressed. I actually addressed an audience of one once. Well, anyway, if I had known I was going to be recorded this afternoon, I would have you know, actually prepared something. I'm going to talk about civic engagement, yes, but in a couple of different senses. And... Um, I really want to provide some background first because civic engagement like service learning and, and uh, similar notions um, really aren't particularly meaningful if they are cut off from uh, the kind of analysis and uh, concerns and, and so on and so forth that have led to their creation. So I'd like to talk to you uh, very briefly about that, and then when we move to discussion, we can talk about more concrete matters if you're so inclined. Now, this is rather, rather simplified, so I'll just uh, count on you to fill in the, the details. These are just the, uh, the highlights, and this is a very oversimplified uh, uh, description of what has gone on uh, over the course of history uh, in the world. In the beginning was the life world. Now, the life world is a term that comes from Jürgen Habermas, and he uses it in contrast to what he calls modernity. But for my purposes, uh, it's probably just as well to think about it as uh, human society and communities in an early, the earliest state of development. When things like kinship relations were particularly important, um, ritual, uh, the expressive arts like music and dance, uh, where spirituality and wisdom and everything were more prominent in people's lives. Uh, Life compared to the way we live it today was much slower, uh, much less complex, and so on. Now, in this kind of world, all of these things fit together rather seamlessly. It doesn't mean there weren't tensions and, and, and so on and so forth, but people didn't think about, didn't act in any of these roles or capacities uh, as if they were hobbies or vocations or something like that. They were part, just part of life. Uh, they were an aspect or facet of their daily life. Now, they fit together so well because they emerged organically and naturally. You know, they were created without conscious intention, without planning. Uh, they emerged spontaneously over time. 
Most important of all, they met the needs and served the purposes of the group and its members. Might, might very well have served the needs and purposes of some members more than others, males rather than females, uh, um, citizens versus slaves, and so on and so forth. But for those uh, in the, uh, the dominant life world, the primary inhabitants, uh, it was stable. It, it served the, the needs of that continuing way of life. Uh, and changed only under pressure from um, uh, often external uh, changes, environmental changes, uh, incursions by other people, and so on and so forth. Now, over time, and this is a big leap from like about 300,000 years ago to um, maybe a 1,000 years, uh, uh, 3,000 years ago, something like that. Over time, as human societies and civilizations became more complex and technologically advanced, the life world created systems to meet people's new needs and to advance their new purposes. Now, in the, in the modern world, the chief innovations, the primary systems that took a place in people's lives were the market, which emerged in the 17th and 16th centuries, and also the state, which emerged, the great nation states emerging out of the medieval uh, period um, in the 15th and 14th century. Well, the systems were good. I mean, they represented uh, a response to changing circumstances and the structures and processes were uh, more universalized, uh, they were more rational, uh, efficient, effective, and more or less fair, at least in, in the beginning. But the systems grew and grew, and as they did, they developed purposes, needs, and goals that were their own, and that very few people could control even a little bit. And we're all familiar with the idea of bureaucracy, right? Uh, any kind of a bureaucracy, corporate, uh, governmental, or whatever, uh, is the classic example of a system that has sort of taken on a life of its own that... Uh, is very difficult to redirect uh, and that often uh, responds to imperatives that no one in particular uh, wants it to. That doesn't mean there aren't people who benefit from it. It doesn't mean there aren't people who have relatively more control than others. Anyway, what happened when these systems developed, uh, particularly over the last couple of centuries, is that the life world has gotten squeezed to the margins. Okay? People try to maintain those um, feelings of meaningfulness and purpose and connection and so on, but they, they think of it as something that they do in their private lives, something to do with friends and family and then maybe fellow church members and, and so on. Um, they don't by and large, even though they might, might identify with their uh, roles in these systems, whether it's entrepreneur, uh, corporate leader, um, uh, professor, whatever it is, they may take their part of their identity and their satisfaction in life from carrying out their roles. But by and large, the, the systems have been pervaded by a... Um, an instrumentality. Uh, essentially, they were created as means to, to end. They don't have the kind of intrinsic uh, human purpose and, uh, and so on that people historically have always uh, enjoyed and always sought. Now, if you just stop and think about it, these systems dominate much of our lives today. 
For example, a lot of what we consume is produced by non-local producers and the price is set by non-local forces of supply and demand. For example, whether you can get a mortgage and at what price isn't up to George Bailey uh, in the movie It's a Wonderful Life or even to mean old Mr. Potter. Okay, It's up to now Bank of America, which bought Countrywide and Countrywide at one time had some huge percentage of all the mortgages in the country. And we can see what happened when those mortgages started getting bundled and sold as um, derivatives for investment by uh, various investors. Many people work, uh, work for large corporations that are divisions of divisions of multinational conglomerates which are directed by decision makers with little knowledge or interest of, of local impacts. Uh, I guess there used to be a Coret store here in Chico. Well, Coret of California, which is actually headquartered in New York, is a part of Kelwood, located in Chesterton, Missouri, which is a part of Sun Capital Partners of Boca Raton, LA, New York, London, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Paris, and Frankfurt. Think about K-12 education. Yes, we do have local school boards and administrations, although they can be rather bureaucratic. Just try getting something changed or something done by going to your local school board or school district. But they're also affected by regulations and laws um, passed down to them from the California, California Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, remember, no child left behind, <laughs> the California Assembly and the U.S. Congress. Or in higher education, this is not a particularly large and bureaucratic campus as universities go, but it is part of a 23 campus system, which is also greatly influenced, if not outright controlled, by uh, government entities, uh, whether administrative or policy making. Well, you might think maybe your doctor, okay, uh, or your lawyer who hangs out a shingle, okay, maybe he or she's got control over their practice and what they do. Well, not to hear them tell it, it's really the insurance companies that make decisions for them and, and determine what services they can provide and at what cost. So when we're talking about foundations, corporations, governments, political parties, interest groups, and so on, in modern societies like the United States with more than 300 million people and a way of life, uh, of life that is economically and technologically very complex and moving very fast, the difference that one individual can make is pretty small. Yeah, there are exceptions. We have plenty of exceptions, but that just proves the rule, I think, that most of us enjoy very little connection to and control over the forces that create the kind of world that we live in. Now, where does the real you reside? Do you live in a kind of life world embedded in uh, an extended family uh, and friends that are multi-generational, who have lived in the same place for a long time? Or do you live more in, the, in one of the systems? Most of the people you know, the things you do, uh, your identity, your values, your goals, and so on, are all very much bound up with one or more systems. Which do you identify with? Do you experience any tension or dissonance between them, between the different values and priorities uh, that they have? For our purposes here, one of the tensions uh, that I'm interested in is between our responsibilities as a citizen and our responsibilities as a professional, which takes priority in which circumstances. Now, in, in the life world, those kinds of things, because over time, because life was simpler and simpler and slower, those sort of questions got answered. Uh, it may be your uh, position in a set of kinship relations that determine what role and its expectations or values took precedence over others. 
it's a real problem for a lot of people today. Is my first responsibility to make a profit for the corporation I head, or is it to look play, to play my part as a citizen and look out for the the well-being and good of everybody uh, in our uh, in our economic system? A few years ago, I was in a meeting of um, people interested in K-12 education. And we, it was a facilitated meeting, some sort of planning or something like that. And I remember that the facilitator asked people to raise their hand, everybody who wouldn't rather be doing something else. In other words, everybody should, should raise their hand if what they were doing right then, uh, right, uh, right now was what they really would prefer to do if they had any choice in the matter. And I thought, you know, most people would raise their hands because these were people really committed to improving uh, K-12 education policy. Nobody raised their hand. I was really surprised. So it makes you think, you know, is life really as good as we want it to be? Do you feel fulfilled, free? Are you the author of your own life? If not, what are you dissatisfied with? What could you change? Or what would you change? Could you change it if you wanted to? Could you change it by yourself? You're here. Weighed down by the systems and pushed to the edge of the life world. So can we recover what was good about the life world and tame the system so they're more responsive to human needs and purposes? Probably not. <laughs> but if the life world in some form that's appropriate to our understanding, uh, our uh, perceptions, our level of knowledge, uh, our level of economic and technological development and so forth. If a, a, a new life world is to regain ascendancy over the systems, it'll do so only by asserting its moral and political authority. In other words, a life world must become a democracy world. In a democracy, a true democracy, we are responsible for the kind of world we live in, the kind of communities and society we inhabit, the quality of life we experience, and the meaning we derive from it. We should ask ourselves whether, if we are responsible for those things, we are, in fact, in charge. Do we have control, collectively? Can we create the kind of world that we want? Or do we find ourselves frustrated and thwarted by systems that just seem overwhelmingly complex and powerful compared to our ability even to work together, to collaborate as groups, organizations, and communities? So for me, Civic engagement, then, means two things. In the world, the public world out there, the communities we live in and the society we live in, civic engagement means participating in a process of recovering and exercising popular democratic authority to create and sustain a way of life that's good for all of us. If not necessarily the best, that we would all like to see, at least one that we can all say, yeah, this is, this is not bad. We're moving in the right direction. This is basically a good life. So it's participating in bringing the systems back under control by asserting our collective democratic authority. So what is civic engagement in an educational context? Well, it's learning through experience, through reflection, 
the beliefs, attitudes, and dispositions and skills that are needed for anyone to work constructively and productively as a member, or as I might, might say, a joint owner of a democratic community. And in this respect, I distinguish civic engagement, which incidentally has, is a very compendious term. Uh, it's used to cover a wide range of activities in which members of a higher education institution, faculty, staff, students, and so on, interact with people in the surrounding area, surrounding communities. So it could be any number of things. But what I want to bring attention to is this idea of gaining experience of it being part of a student's education to acquire experience and to develop skills in making decisions together, in coming to judgments together, in taking action together with others. Historically, ever since at least the, the Tocqueville remarked upon it in the 1830s, we've relied upon participation in voluntary associations and organizations to acquire the essentially democratic skill. And what Tocqueville observed was that those skills transferred very nicely to the uh, political world. At the same time, religion was still a prominent part of people's, most people's lives. It was, a, it was changing already, but it was still in some respects a vestige of a more integrated, more natural, spontaneous aspect of a life world. And Tocqueville wondered whether when religious beliefs and commitments began to subside, whether democracy would really long endure. Uh, he, like the founders, wondered where our ethical uh, principles and imperatives would, would come from. And to the extent that we find that we don't share a set of values and priorities and principles today, to that extent, we may have to do what's never, or at least try to do, what's never been done before, and that is intentionally recreate what has always before emerged naturally and spontaneously. And nobody is sure whether that can be done. About, I think about the only thing we can be sure is that much of what troubles us about modern life ultimately remediable at all will depend on people regaining control over their lives. And for me, that's what civic engagement is about, and that's what students need to learn. Those, those skills, those dispositions, those attitudes, and so on, that enable them competently and with confidence to go out into the world and work together with their fellow citizens to make things happen, to bring about goods that wouldn't arise otherwise. And that's the end of my formal presentation. So if you have any questions or comments, we can take them now. Yeah, well, please. It sounds pretty daunting. The idea of regaining control over your, your life. Um, and as you pointed out at the beginning, um, you know, the, the systems are so pervasive and, and apparently, you know, very powerful. It, it, how do we, how can one hope to try to approach that? Well, uh, two things I would say in respect. One is that in very, very few places is democracy really a way of life. Yes, we have representative government, 
rights, and we do have the freedom to vote and throw the rascals out, and so on and so forth. And we do have citizens who participate in non-governmental activities, volunteer activities, and so on. But take a community like Chico, maybe 80,000 people. What's the percentage of citizens who are actively involved in doing all of the things that get done in this community? Uh, probably a very, very small percentage. It's, you know, usually in any community, roughly the same small group, relatively speaking, of people who do everything. Most people, and this is understandable, given the impact of the systems on our lives, are struggling just to get by. They've got one job that brings in an income. They have another job in the form of running a family, running a household economy. They may have a third job, at least in the sense of a uh, demand on their time and energy in the form of uh, uh, churches or other voluntary uh, activities, you know, the proverbial uh, soccer mom. And, uh, you know, I coached youth football for, for four years, and uh, the kids I had on my team were not only playing football, but they were at the same time playing hockey, playing soccer, playing baseball in the fall. You know, these kids, one mother actually had a kind of a color-coded chart um, for her four kids so that she knew where she had to be when so that she didn't forget any of them and uh, not pick them up. Somehow we have to find a way for more people more easily and with less of a, an imposition or a burden on their time and energy to re-engage, to involve themselves in not so much making technical decisions of the sort that a city council makes or a state assembly or, or whatever, but more in the matter of clarifying what's important to us in this community, of reaching judgments in difficult cases that don't have clear right and wrong answers, of setting priorities when we know that there are several good things in competition with each other and we can't choose without uh, loss. So that kind of what what is really, I think, a challenging problem is to make democracy a way of life again but in a way that is easy and natural so that it doesn't become yet another drag on people's time and energy. Now, the other answer to that question, Lee, I think is maybe we fight systems with systems. Take uh, food distribution. Now, I don't know how it is here in in Safeway, at Safeway, but when I lived in, in Colorado, Most of the food that I would get at a grocery store was trucked in from somewhere else. A lot of from California, some from other uh, principal agricultural regions in the country. That's a system, that agricultural food growing and distribution system, that uh, we don't have much control over. Uh, You know, I'm always frustrated that uh, the things I want to buy that are good for me uh, are so much more expensive than the stuff in uh, Safeway or Rayleigh's or Walmart. So to the extent we can, maybe we can begin to replace our dependence on some of those big impersonal systems with smaller uh, systems like growing food locally, distributing it locally. Um, national defense is going to be kind of hard to provide on a local level. Um, but there are a lot of other things that, that we can make less bureaucratic. I think even though I recognize the 
uh, difficulties that charter schools have created for the public schools, because I'm a big supporter of public schools. Having seen it up close in Colorado, I have to say that in terms of getting people excited and energized and taking responsibility, charter, charter schools have been, on the whole, a good thing. They've shaken up a complacent educational bureaucracy in many places. And that, in, in a lot of cases, I think has had a salutary impact on the system. Um, the school district that I lived in uh, had about 10 high schools the size of Chico in Pleasant Valley. Now, in my view, that's way too big for a school system to be. I think there are levels of organization that are much more, much better suited to the desire and the interest, uh, the need of people to participate in making decisions about the education of their own children and about the education of children in their community. So, I think we need to reinvent, rethink various ways that we meet our needs. Um, you know, there are some there are some cooperatives, Associated Press, Costco, um, and a number of others. And the best one I can think of, I'll, t uh, I'll tell you in just a second, that are not as vulnerable to impersonal social forces as publicly traded corporations are. I believe Enlo Medical Center is a nonprofit that's you know governed here. It's it's based here, it's ours. If that were to become a private hospital, part of Humana or uh, one of the big uh, medical service providers, we might lose a lot of control over what services are offered there and what they cost. So maybe we need to think about um, alternatives to either government-run institutions on the one hand or privately uh, operated ones on the other hand. Now, the best example of cooperative that I know of is the Mondragon Cooperative in southwest Spain, actually in, in Basque country, which was set up by a, initially in the early part of the 20th century by a Catholic priest who came there to help people establish a school for their children. Well, Mondragon is now an employee-owned conglomerate. They manufacture, they provide health services, insurance. They don't take investment capital from outside. They borrow from themselves. They profits, they put right back into the cooperative. And it's if it were a private company, it would be in something like the top 100 corporations in the, in the world. But as you might expect, it has a great deal of, of satisfaction on the part of the people who work for it. Um, not many conflicts with the surrounding community because it's an outgrowth of that community and it still serves that community. And if those people down in Basque country in southwestern France can do what they've done with a cooperative, you know, why can't we? Other questions or comments? Do you have a question? Well, I'm not a big speaker in public schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I sent my children to uh, public school here mm -hmm. for a few years and mm -hmm. became dissatisfied. And then they went to charter schools for a while. And uh, 
I, I remember once asking one of our administrators to help out the charter school by giving access to our library, maybe, and, and, and got a political response that it didn't agree with that particular administrator's political values. But eventually, ended up my wife and I homeschooling our children. Uh, I teach moral issues and parenting and the mm -hmm. philosophy a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find um, that what troubles me about civic engagement is uh, I, I think I need to leave some of my values at home when I go to the classroom. And I'm acutely aware of this because my values aren't the same as the majority of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I'd like to hear from, from you your, your, your thoughts about why the university is the place to foster civic engagement, given that there's such diversity of values of, of basic issues. In, in terms of being able to introduce our students to the life of the mind, mm -hmm. that's my problem, the last part, the life of the mind. Right, right. Well, a complete answer, I, I think, would take account of uh, uh, the entire cultural history of the United States and the notion of anti-intellectualism in American life and, and so on and so forth. One thing I want to say, though, is that universities, at least publicly supported ones, are public creatures. They're cr creations of our society. To me, that creates an obligation or a duty on the part of the institution to educate young people in the ways that the society that created it wants it to. Now, if we conceive of our way of life as a democratic one and our society as a democracy, which I don't think it is, yes, well, that, that's a fraught term as well. The way it's been used in American political history simply means not a, not a monarchy. But it's not a republic even in the, the sense in which Montesquieu used that term with the whole notion of civic virtue and so on. What we have is a representative liberal regime um, that's semi-participatory. Well, the Bill of Rights are, is a key institution in most liberal regimes. I mean, Britain has an unwritten constitution, but they still have a common law tradition of most of the same rights that, that we do. So, we yes, by the way terms republic and, and democracy are used today, yeah, I mean, you'd put the United States in that category rather than, you know, the category that you put Zambia in, or even you know, even South Korea or whatever. But I think the point is that what has happened to learning and teaching in the university, it's become such a privatized affair. You pursue your research and writing interests, your colleagues pursue theirs. You may spend more time communicating with other people in your sub-discipline than you do a person down the hall. People don't talk a whole lot across disciplines. So what we have, in a way, is kind of a reflection of a highly fragmented society that is held together by some very thinly shared values and interests but that really uh, has no longer any coherent purpose or direction, especially if you ask people who don't go to college, don't send their 
kids to college. Even those who do are, look to the university mainly as a way of preparing their young people to, t to start careers. It's a, it's a career preparation uh, institution, and it's all of public education, I think, is going in the same direction that the University of Phoenix is going in. I mean, suppose that philosophy were a cost center in itself, and the courses it offered and the number of faculty hired and tenured and so on depended on the number of students you could persuade to sit in your classes. Well, there are universities that look at things exactly that way. And the business school might say, well, why should we be subsidizing the philosophy department? We bring in the students. The money should go to us. Well, that way of thinking is already akin to a market way of thinking, not to one in which we talk about and decide what our values and priorities will be. Unless you believe in some sort of foundational approach to values and principles. In our tradition, political tradition in the United States, it's the natural law, natural rights tradition, uh, foundation. For other peoples, it's, they find it in their religious traditions. It's what scripture reveals uh, or what God teaches or whatever. But if we look at it from a more pragmatist perspective, that there is no foundation other than our shared sense of what is good and bad, right and wrong, desirable and undesirable, then in order to keep that moral and political practice alive and thriving, it depends upon discourse, public discourse. And the question is, what kind of discourse are we going to have? Are we going to have one that resembles uh, when Norman Potter, it's a few years ago, said that the, um, the point of politics was to discredit one's opponents at the, um, in debate and beat them into submission at the polls. Well, I think that what we're beginning to see is, especially if you take a look at Fox News for any length of time, is the reductio ad absurdum of that approach to public discourse. It's not even debate in a competitive sense anymore. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's mutual recrimination. I don't think we can have a way of life in which everyone feels respected, included, uh, in which they feel they are moral and political agents, without our deliberately creating safe public spaces for people to listen to each other, to disagree with each other, but to do so in a way that leaves our relationships with each other stronger rather than weaker, but doesn't leave them in tatters. The small farming community wasn't perfect by any means. A lot of disadvantages to any small communities. But one of the advantages is that people were accountable to each other because they couldn't avoid each other. In Community and the Politics of Place, Dan Chemist talks about barn raising. He grew up on a ranch in eastern Montana. When his family needed a new barn, the neighbors came over and helped. And they did so because they knew they would depend on his family to help them when they needed something. Reciprocity is, is, is both a psychological and a philosophical principle. I think it's a psychological one because it proved adaptive in the long evolution of the species. I think it's also been built into our traditional ways of thinking morally and politically. But it has been driven away, submerged, by the fact that 
we now are not really accountable to each other. We can say or do whatever we want because the chances of our having to depend on any particular opponent of ours are slim to none. And I think that's had uh, a terribly harmful effect on our sense that we live in a good place, that we live a good way of life. I think that the receding role of democracy in our way of life is one of the primary causes of the dissatisfaction, the vague dissatisfaction that people feel with life in their communities and in the country. Um, so just as collective inquiry among scholars is a desirable thing, because that's how knowledge grows. Collective inquiry is also valuable and desirable in a democracy as the way we make decisions together, the way we reach judgments together. And there's nowhere that that's really being taught. And it ought to be part of the same educational experience because when young people leave the university, they're not going to be just lawyers, doctors, businessmen, and so on and so forth. They're going to be citizens. Do we want to recreate the kind of citizens that we see all too frequently in our communities and society today? Or do we want to try to create citizens who can run and govern themselves and their communities in a way that is more responsive to the needs and values that people have. I think public institutions in particular have that responsibility. And if we are reluctant to say, these are the values of a democracy and I subscribe to them, then I think there's something terribly wrong. Because even if we don't define things in the same way, even if at some level, uh, our priorities aren't exactly the same. We all value personal freedom. We all value respect from others. We all value reliability, accountability, and so on and so forth. Yes, in particular situations, we may want to put one higher uh, than another, uh, and that differs from person to person. But none of us has any foundation for our values and principles except the ones that are supported through a continuing, ongoing practice of moral and political dialogue. And it's that capacity to engage confidently and competently in that continuing moral and political dialogue that I think most young people don't emerge from this university with. And it needs to be, it needs to happen somewhere, and I think it ought to happen here. Yeah, I tend to go on. Anyway, thank you very much.